Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Jiu-Jitsu Times podcast. I am your host, Kevin Bradley, joined as always by my co-host, Mr. Kevin Gallagher. And we have got an amazing guest for you today, a returning guest, actually, and fan favorite here to talk about his latest written work. And we're very excited to get into it. But before we do, we got to pay the bills real quick and shout out longtime sponsors of the show. No judges needed. Your one-stop shop for all of your combat sports needs. I'm talking rash guards and geese, along with casual wear, so you can rep the culture outside of the gym. I'm talking hoodies and t-shirts, amazing designs throughout. And if you'll notice, one of their more handsome models for their geese, our very own Kevin Gallagher. Now, you're looking at these prices and you're wondering, how can I save some money? We're here to help you out. Uh, they've partnered with us to get you guys a promo code. So type in the code JJT at checkout and it will knock off 20% off all and every purchase, which is a great deal. Coronavirus is shellacking all of us nonstop. We got an incoming second wave possibly. So do yourself a favor, save some money, get yourself some merch before we got all locked down again for quarantine. And when you support these guys, you're supporting jujitsu. They're a very great brand for the culture. They help a lot of people out including us, two yahoos who like to talk about pajama wrestling all day. So once again, code JJT for 20% off and let them know we sent you. All right, ad read over. And now I can go back to talking about our incredibly uh, blue chip guest who's blowing a lot of valuable time here talking to us, but we're not complaining. Uh, Promoting his latest book, Opening Closed Guard. Please join us in welcoming to the show uh, BJJ Black Belt, a former MMA fighter, filmmaker, author, and former Clash of Clans addict, Mr. Robert Drysdale. Rob, thank you so much for coming back on the show. How you doing? Good, good. My favorite one was the former Clash of Clans addict. <laughs> I mean, that's if I, I've probably rewatched our episode or your episode of this show more than any other, and that's the part that just always, always <laughs> makes me laugh. <laughs> Do, man. Like, I can't believe how much time I spent playing that game. I'm, oh. I'm you know, happy I got rid of it, though. Like, it was it was an important move in my life to get rid of that game. <laughs> That's funny. I, I think about <laughs> canceling an app as an important, like, a path towards success. <laughs> You're just like, in the same way that guys talk about dropping heroin, we're talking yeah. about, man, that app just ate up so much of my life. Yeah. I, I got to I got it. Before we get into anything, I got to say, with quarantine and how locked down things have been, have you been tempted to stray back into the world of Clash of Clans? No, man. I think of it with, and I actually developed, like, I, I just dislike video games in general now. I went from being a video game person to, like, I can't even, I don't I have zero desire to play any games. Yeah. I, I was, I, I go back and forth. I don't play a whole lot, but every once in a while I'll get a game. And I'll have my system and I'll sit down and play it just because I'm enjoying it. And then once I start playing, I'm like, oh, God, the, the crazy person in me won't let me stop until I beat it. So I have to keep playing it and beat it. Exactly. But lately, I have been fucking with it. But that's exactly, that's why I don't like to touch them because once I, I have like an addictive personality, like I have to beat the game. And some of these games are 800 hours long. Yes, I, 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 we're so off topic, but I've, I've actually recently fallen back into that trap with uh, this game Skyrim. I don't know if yeah. any of you guys, it's this big for a game you can basically play forever. You're, you're fighting dragons and stuff. And I found myself after I'm done with work, I'll log in like four hours of playing a day, but those four hours will take me into 3 a.m. Yeah. every time. And then I'm just groggy the next day. So. For what? Just so you can say you're playing a game. You're playing a game that can never, never I'm gonna just end, like, never gonna oh, beat. man, I got to do the Thieves Guild. I got to steal this. I got to go get the rubies. I got to join the companions. And it's yeah. just like, eventually <laughs> I'll I'll ease out of it and I'll shake it off. And uh, thankfully, I don't make enough money to really uh, keep the habit up. So, <laughs> <laughs> which is a double-edged sword. And, uh, you know, say I got to, I'm uh, since our last podcast, I've actually got engaged. So I'm saving for a wedding now. Congratulations. So that's my, well, thank you very much, sir. Well, we are not going to talk. We're not here to talk about that. <laughs> we are here to talk about the book that we have not been able to stop talking about on multiple episodes of this podcast, and that is Opening Closed Guard, which is a, like a series of, of facts and, and information and, and a journey on how you, you went about making your film, which is uh, what we brought you on to talk about last time. So uh, 
let's just go over a little bit about the the book process. Um, is this your first book? Yes, it's um, yeah, and it wasn't planned. It was really spontaneous. It was a product of a quarantine, really. <laughs> I mean, very productive use of your time. <laughs> I was, I I was impressed by re when you're reading the book. You can think about the timelines and some of the some of the chapters that you wrote. I'm like, wow, like he just wrote that like three months ago. <laughs> like thinking about what's going on in, in the world at that time. Yeah, it was, you know, it was originally um um one of the, the, the historians that I talked to, Roberto Pedrera, who really helped me a lot throughout the process. I always want to give him credit. And uh, he suggested I write an article about my memories. I remember I think he was like he thought it was uh, I, you know, I think it was at least curious that, um, you know, Horian would have asked for that much money and then Halo would have asked for that much money to be interviewed. I'm like, man, you, people need to know this. And he suggested, like, this is interesting stuff. You should put it uh, in an article, right? And I started writing an article. And next, it was meant to be a 2,000 word article, maybe 3,000 word article. Next thing you know, like, I'm like 30, 40,000 words in and I'm not even halfway there. I'm like, I can keep going. So I just kept right. going and going. I actually wrote my part of the book was written in like two weeks. It was written fairly quickly. And then, you know, the big chunk of the book is, is the transcripts from, uh, from our interviews. Uh, that took longer to edit because they were ready, but they had to be edited. That took about two months. That was a lot of work, a lot of back and forth between me and my editor, Scott Burr. And um, but we got it done. You know, that was that was but that was most of the work was editing the transcripts, really. Now, the writing was fairly fun and. and it came out of me fairly quickly because um, it was still fresh in my memory. And these were conclusions I had been talking about in podcasts and conclusions I had reached over time. So it wasn't, I had, I had, I didn't have to do a lot of thinking. A lot of things, I think when you're writing, you're thinking, right? There's a lot of, there's a, a, an exercise of digesting the information. I think I had done that over the course of the last three years. So I was just putting my thoughts on, on paper and it was, it was fairly easy. So are, are the interviews uh, any different from the interviews that are going to go into the documentary? Are they longer? Did you abbreviate them more in, for the documentary sake? Are they, are they any, any changes at all, like new information or different information? We're going to have about probably 5% or less of the uh, interviews in the documentary. Because That's cool. So you get more information. The, the, the long story short of it was, are you getting more information from the book than you would from the documentary? Obviously, the answer is yes. But I was just curious about the actual transcripts from the. Uh, so basically, you know, if you're really into jujitsu, but you don't care at all about history, you're probably going to watch a documentary. You may want to watch a documentary. If you care somewhat about jujitsu history, you're going to you know, watch a documentary, read the book. If you really, really care about digital history and you're an absolute nerd about this stuff, you're going to have to get into all the readings that I recommend in the book. And then, and you know, and then you come up with your own conclusions. That's sort of my uh, my advice to people. You know, but yeah. I think people will probably stop at the documentary, maybe book level. Few people have the the energy to go dig up, you know, primary sources. I'm already I'm already considering new new pieces of information to read on the topic. Like I just I turned myself into some kind of like samurai monk over the last freaking uh, three or two months of reading that book and thinking to myself like I'm reconnecting to the source and all the things. It's something has become like a, a passion for me, and even more than just my it's fun. history is fun. It I I well I, that actually brings me to something I wanted to go over, which is one of the more interesting parts of your book that I found. And uh, we're going to get into a little bit of a hyperbole here, but for a lot of people, jujitsu figures, the figures in our sport are, are mythical. And I feel like you're, you're among them for a lot of people, for a lot of different reasons, uh, point of comparison. Let's say if John Donaher is uh, the professor X of jujitsu, as a lot of people have uh, taken to calling him. For my money, you're our Indiana Jones. You're our guy that's going into uh, spelunking for these these pieces of hidden lore and, and bringing them back to us for, for all to enjoy. And so that is how a lot of people know you as this learned historian. But you talk a little bit about how when you entered this field, you found that there were tons of people already doing the work and, and looking into it and that you were very much a neophyte. Yeah. So f as someone who is a who's considered a... a a, a teacher of jujitsu, like a master of jujitsu, a master of a lot of things. How did it feel entering the field as a newbie, the new guy on the block? It was exciting, man. Like, I, mean, I think that, you know, history has always been 
I, I've always, you know, my, my passion for history and the humanities has always, you know, lived, coexisted parallel with my passion for jujitsu. When I wasn't on the mats, I was actually reading or discussing. I, I enjoy the the, the the field, right? Like I think it's fun. So I walked in there not knowing much about jujitsu history or nothing at all, other than what I had heard on you know in interviews or read on the internet, which is really mostly incorrect. Um, but you know, I think I knew how to interpret history. I think I knew how to read. Man, I think I knew how to read the facts. I think that you can, you know, even if you're well read in, let's say something like you know ancient history. And you pick up books on contemporary history, you you're still. I mean, it, it translates. A lot of it carries over. Not the technical knowledge, not the dates, not the characters, not the events themselves, but the ability to interpret and filter through that information and weed out the BS. Long story short, in colloquial language, you know. And I think I had that. I think I had that. But like, you know, to be fair, there's some people that have been studying this in Brazil for decades. Um, not a lot. None, none of them, to my knowledge, were actually doing it professionally, other than. Uh, José Tuficairos and Roberto Pereira, which are work professionals. Right? Like the majority of them are very amateurish, and, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way. That's in the sense that they um, – I'm sorry, one second here, guys. My phone just – yeah. I, just not in a derogatory way, but more in the sense that they – a lot of times you can spend a lot of time in a library looking over facts and not have the ability to interpret them or not having the rigor to be able to analyze what is – and what you wish were. So there's, you know, even though some of these guys have spent 20 years studying this, they don't understand historical methodology. And, you know, it's, you sound like a snob when you say this, but it's kind of like, it's like in jujitsu, you can't learn jujitsu on YouTube, right? You have to, have to be in a gym. It's the same with history. I mean, you can, can you learn history just by winging it yourself? Yeah, but your interpretation is, it's, if you don't learn methodology, you're going to be incorrect a lot of times. That's something that's typically taught in, at the academic level. Explain, <laughs> explain to me real quick what you mean by methodology, because I kind of I'm kind of confused yeah. by that a little bit. Well, for example, like something it's it's um, you know long story short, I'm going to summarize it. You know, in in law, one is innocent until proven guilty. Correct. So what? But what if I think you're a criminal? Well, what I think is irrelevant. What does the evidence say? Right. And a lot of people, they get lost to this, like they get like circumstantial evidence and they take it to be because they wish it were. It probably is. So let's write it down and say that it was. And a good historian wouldn't do that. A good historian, you might say he allegedly said this, or he allegedly did that. He might leave it vague. He might say there's some circumstantial evidence pointing in this direction, but we can't say definitely that it was. Right. And people that don't have training, a lot of times just jump to these conclusions and they write it down. And because they've been studying it for 20 years, people go, oh, it's probably true. This guy's been studying it for 20 years. Well, just because you've been studying it 20 years does not mean you know how to interpret information. And that has been one of the most difficult things to get over throughout this process is like dealing with some of these guys. They don't understand methodology. And, and I don't mean this as an answer. It's just that they, they don't have the – it's just lack of skepticism. There's no way around it. Do you think – do you th- sorry, I mean interrupt. Do you, do you think that that lack of methodology is is caused by a disposition to be prone to a particular yeah. thought based upon where your loyalties lie? Yes, a hundred percent. And that and that is you see this in even professional historians can be victim of this. By the way, like you have, suppose you're a Marxist historian, you're going to pick and choose your data. Suppose you're an anti-Marxist historian, you're going to pick and choose your data. Right. Suppose you're a nationalist historian, you're going to pick and choose your data, and you're going to interpret facts. You know, they're going to be pro-Brazilian or pro-American. They're going to be, um, and, and there's a lot of that going on. And you know, I think a historian, you should be pragmatic and objective. The country where you happen to be born into, or what social class you belong to, or the color of your skin, or what gender you belong to, should not interfere in your interpretations. They have to be right down the middle, straightforward, and you should not allow any kind of ideology interfere. That doesn't happen, though. It's very, very difficult to find a historian who's able to do that because we all have our passions and our leanings. And that's why I spend the whole introduction talking about this, because it does not pertain directly to the history of jiu-jitsu. But it's, I wanted to lay out my, my methodology looking into this. Like, what is it that I'm looking at and what is I trying to interpret? You know, in some ways, I'll come out critical of, of the of the Americanization of jiu-jitsu. That's clear in the book. And then I'll be critical of Brazilians. And the next one I'm saying Maeda played no role. So people were, you know, not no role, but it's an exaggerated role. Maeda right. didn't really do that much. So for some people, I'm, you know, cheating on the Japanese, for example. And and that's just, that's just 
I think that's just a poor way of looking at things. History does not have to be, you know, this political party or that political party. History is a number of events, and you may not like them, but you can't change the facts. I, you, I, go ahead, Kev, sorry. I was just going to say, it sounds like a lot of what your 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 work as a whole, the book along with the the, the making of the documentary, it feels like it, it expands beyond just just, just recording history. It, it feels like you're going more into historiography, you yeah. know, like uh, analyzing the context by which things were recorded, why they were recorded that way. Do you agree with that? I, and and I didn't want to get bored. I was worried about being boring. I tried to, to to color it as much as I could, so it wasn't you know historiography methodology can be very very boring to read. And I tried to color it as best I could, and it turned out to be like I think my introduction is my favorite part of the whole book. Maybe not for most people, but I I end up liking it a lot because I think that I was able to you know give my methodology uh, of going into walking into this without being incredibly boring, right? Um, and, but that was, that's, that's exactly it, man. There's, um, uh, you know, it's very difficult to write history without any bias. So it's something you have to be constantly checking. And, uh, a lot of the historians or the researchers we were talking to, they, they had a really hard time doing this. Like they're very pro grace or they're very anti grace. Some of them are fiercely anti grace. They're like, no, you got to say this. I'm like, I think he was important. I don't care what his surname is. This is what he did. It's what he did that matters, not what surname he has. And then next, the next sentence, I'm, I sound like very anti-Gracie because I, I have condemned this guy for what he did, right? Oh, for this other guy's going to think I'm anti-Gracie now. So it's, it's like people cannot see the world unless it's through a political party. Like they cannot see facts free of ideology and politics. And I talk about that as well. It's a huge flaw in jujitsu historiography. It's a huge flaw in the world today. People just stick to their teams and their team has to win no matter what. Well, I think yep. it's weird because I think you're saying that people look at that name, Gracie. If it's tacked on to the end of your name, then you must as ascribe to a certain set of beliefs for the family. You must be this and X, Y, and Z for the family. But a family as big as the Gracies and, you know, with all due respect, as full of egos, you have a lot of people jockeying for their own agendas and yeah. trying to stand out among the Gracies. So I feel like looking at them as individuals is the only way you can get anything done. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Kev, I cut, I cut you off. Um, no, you're good, man. Like, go ahead. You're good. So uh, the, one, the one thing I wanted to say was this is that, you know, uh, the reason why I think this book is as successful as it is and this book is getting the amount of, of public, public recognition it is, is for twofold, obviously because you're a part of it, you know, and I think that in particular, not only you lending your name to it and obviously doing the bulk of the research is more than just you lending your name. You did all the legwork for it too. But the fact that it's associated with someone that is, you know, a pillar of the jujitsu community, which you yourself are, you know, it gives this, book gravitas it gives it something that makes it more real and even more than that in particular to the person that you are you know you are a hybrid you're you're you're, you're an american brazilian so you have that take to be not politically or not culturally biased to the brazilian point of view and you know you you're willing to go in and look at these guys in the face and say hey man I respect you as the master that you are. I want to learn from you. I want to get the information out of you. But, you know, I have enough recognition in my life that I don't have to crumble and bow at your feet when you speak. And, 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 and think of you as a contemporary, even though I hold you in the utmost respect, I can get to the reality of the truth and try to keep searching for the truth. Yeah. And, and yes, there's, I think there was some of that. Like, I don't, you know, if I make some enemies, I, I've made my peace with that. If some people aren't going to like me personally, because, which I think is very ignorant, you cannot like the book. It doesn't mean you don't, you know, I, I can separate, I can disagree with you politically and still be your friend. That's, right. I think that's maturity, right? Um, but there was a concern that I would, you know, burn some bridges and I probably did, you know, but I made some new ones too. So I, you know, I'm, I'm talking to you guys. Like, I knew, I've known you, Kevin, for a long time. But I think we've talked more over the last two months than we ever have before. We're, we're, we're like pin pals. I, I felt weird about it after a while. I was like, I can't keep texting him. This is just getting weird. <laughs> but, you know, so I made some really good friends throughout the place as well. So, yeah. um, you know, uh, I, I've learned a lot from Roberto Pedreira, who taught me a lot about this historiography that we're talking about. I have an unfinished master's. And the reason why I started my master's is because I wanted to understand historical research. I want to be better at it. I want to be able to look at facts and interpret them 
skeptically, pragmatically, objectively free of biases. And he was a huge part of that. And I learned that from exchanging, I mean, somewhat learned that, I guess I'm still learning. Um, but, you know, and also like, you know, going back to your point of the book being well-written, I want to give a lot of credit to my editor as well, Scott Burr. He definitely made the book a lot better. So he deserves a lot of credit in this. So I made some friends too. So I made some, I, can, I created some good, uh, healthy and instructive bridges throughout this process. But I probably upset some people as well. I, which I, at this point in my life, man, I, I just turned 39. You kind of get less and less of the shit as you get older. You kind of lose that, like, oh, you know, like, everyone's going to have to like me. No, and I'm perfectly happy with some people not liking me. You know? Like, Jesus didn't make everyone happy. I feel now, you know. So some people aren't going to like what you have to say, but that's their issue, not mine. Let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the particulars now. We, 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 we gave it a brief overview about what it took to put the book together and the, the, some of the things. And, like, kept me and Kevin said a little off air, like, how amazing just even the story of you being able to do this. Like, you know, going to find some Russian oligarch. Yeah, like, I was, this is the whole, like, the whole. I want to I get into that just because, <laughs> uh, you know, funding for independent media has never been easier uh, these days. You know, yeah. you've got a lot of avenues. You've got – Indiegogo, you've got Kickstarter. You you went a little bit of a, a different route in in terms of finding a patron for this this yeah. project. So, like, without getting too much of, of what's in the book, I don't want to spoil anything. Uh, how many moments were you just really truly scared for you know this project? You know, how many moments were you just thinking this could all fall apart right now? The beginning, the beginning, especially. And I think that when uh, when Marbek Castillo like agreed, cause, like, I can't understand a word in Russian. I think they were speaking Chechen. Actually, it was in Russian, and uh, <laughs> I can't even tell the difference. But you know, while he's translating what I'm saying, I remember what I'm pitching, and I I, have, I didn't go to business school. I, I I needed I had help writing the business plan and the budget and all that. And but I know one thing. I I. You know, I, I can. I'm, I'm an amateur in most of what I've got. I've got a lot of hats on, but I'm I'm a blue belt at best at most of it. The one thing I think. Welcome I'm, to the club, man. <laughs> but the one thing I feel like I'm good at is I, if if I believe in something, I can speak very passionate about it. Like if I want to do something, I can I'm, I can be very very convincing. If um you know if I believe in it, I can't I can't read from a teleprompter. I've tried; it doesn't work. But if I speak because I believe in it, then. Uh, you know, I think I can be very convinced. And I think that I, I was able to, um, you know, overcome the language barrier with Marbeck and Stephen. He could see, he was, it was obvious to him how passionate I was about it. I think that came across. And I think that's why he even gave us more money than we had asked for, which is something interesting. <laughs> like, I've never even heard of that. Like, that's when he, he offered me more. It was a lot more than what we asked for, too. I was like, Real man. quick, real quick. Uh, it, because you said that, in my head, all I'm thinking of now is is Marvek going to his son and going, all right, this this uh, the Sasquatch seems very angry. Give him whatever he wants. <laughs> In just my experience, just throw it at him. Throw it at him. <laughs> in my experiences with people that have money, is if they always have more money than you think they do, and what you perceive to be this astronomical number is really just a matter of them going, "Eh, sure, give it to Rob. He's a good guy. I believe in what he's doing." He's it's more about him. proving to them that you are passionate at what you do and showing the value to them. And they, they're, they're pretty no, cool. you're absolutely correct. Like the difference to us, like you know, a hundred thousand dollars to these guys is like ten dollars to us. You exactly. know, pocket change. Yeah, it doesn't make a difference in their life. But, you know, I, I think that – so that was a fun episode. Like, that was really cool. I mean, I've always been interested in the Caucasus, so just being able to spend some time there with them. I had fun. That was that was a crazy trip, man. Like, I went Vegas, Chicago, Doha, Moscow, Grozny, Moscow, Beijing, L.A., Las Vegas. I did that in five days. That's, that's a lot of traveling, dude. That's a whole lot of traveling. I was a record, man. Like, I wasn't sleeping at all. I barely slept the whole time, man. And, like, you, and you got to pitch some Russian oligarch to give you 100 grand. <laughs> so it, was, it was very tiring. But, like, it was fun, too. Like, I was so excited, man. Like, I didn't really – I wasn't sleeping partially because of the time, uh, the jet lag, but partially out of excitement, too. I mean, Let's, how did how did your real quick how did your body hold up going from like Nevada to uh, the the like the 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 European block just like all over the place? Um, I got sick on the way back. I normally do. I, I don't get sick very often unless when I'm severely sleep deprived, my immune system just crashes and I you know traveling. So I remember getting sick, feeling like at some point even feverish, you know, throughout the trip because I just wasn't sleeping well. 
Um, I mean, it wasn't as bad as it sounds like, you know, but it was, I, you know, it, it does, it is exhausting. If I, you're used to sleeping eight hours a day, um, I mean, I'm, you know, it's not that big of a deal, but at the time it was, I was so excited. I just couldn't care less, man. If it were double that amount of work for the same thing I would have done, I would have been triple. It would have not made a difference. It's a weird thing about passion. It just keeps you energized and keeps you going. You don't, you don't forget about time. No, if I care about it, it doesn't really matter, you know, how much work it is. Yeah, you spoke a little bit about that in the end of your book, like the post production part of your book. Yeah. So quickly, let's let's get into some of the, the meat and potatoes of things here. So one of the things that I was not necessarily shocked, but learned throughout the course of the book was like we spoke of earlier, the 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 true lack of Maeda's um influence on the art of Brazil jiu-jitsu and not necessarily the lack of, cause he definitely had, he was the most accomplished jiu-jitsu practitioner at that time. He had the most clout of the Japanese that came over during the, uh, the, the rubber boom and the other things like that. But um, the idea of the narrative of him basically being the conduit that introduced jiu-jitsu to the entirety of Brazil is maybe a little bit misleading. Tell us a little bit about what you found to be, you know, the crux of Maeda's. And I got another particular question, but the, what the biggest part of Maeda's influence on the country was. It, he, you know, Maeda is an interesting, he's a very interesting character for a variety of reasons. Like he's the kind of guy you can easily, I mean, I'm surprised he doesn't have his own biography. Uh, you know, he deserved a documentary just about him. So he he seemed a, like a pretty, like, it seemed like reading up on him, the more we talked about it, it seemed like he was just like an amazing, like, cloak and dagger figure that's all over the world, you know. Used international to be a samurai. man of yeah. mystery, yeah. He used to be peeked around corners still because he was still living that life of the samurai. Yeah. It was pretty amazing. No, he, yeah, he he's a very interesting guy. And the stories that they told about him in the Amazon, he's a very popular guy. Everywhere he went, people liked him. So he was, no doubt, he was a very charismatic but in terms of jiu-jitsu history, I, I wouldn't rank him in the top five. Maybe, maybe not even top ten, man. Like, I, 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 yes, dude. His, uh, like famously, his butterfly guard was shit, man. Like he was always <laughs> <laughs> it's because he's a, his true contribution to jiu-jitsu. We talk a little bit about this in the book. Is that he lent his name to Brazilians who had no credibility unwillingly. It's not like oh, you can use my name if you want. Like these guys were just you know piggybacking off his fame. I trained with Maida, which they may have. You know, most of the people who claim to have trained with Maida never presented any evidence for it. And that's not just Carlos Gracie. That's uh, Donato Pires dos Reis. That's uh, Bianor Oliveira. That's uh, Mario Aleixo. Uh, Mario Aleixo, just to give you an example, when uh, Mitsu Maeda visited Brazil in 1915, he, he was in Rio de Janeiro. So Mario Aleixo claimed to have met him and learned from him. Just possible. We don't know that. We can't confirm that. Five years later, five years later, when Maeda's already in Belém do Pará, he goes to the press with a picture of him taking someone down. He's an Ogoshi takedown, right? And he says, this is Maeda. He's my teacher. So he's trying to, like five years later, when you got to remember, those days, there was no communication between Rio de Janeiro and the Amazon. That's like different planets, man, different galaxies, right? So they could get away with it. So five years later, he goes to the press and he claims that that was Maeda he was taken down. No, you can't see the face. You can't see it was Maeda. But the guy had black hair, right? So people presume that he was telling the truth. I go, there's no way that was Maeda. There's no way that a guy who Maeda considered to be a beginner would be taking him down and Maeda would be allowing him to take that picture. You know why? Because these guys understood perfectly well what meant me applying a move to you and that picture ended up on the press. It sets a hierarchy. And there's no way Maeda would have been allowed to someone who he just met to be taking him down and have a picture taken. It so, seemed like the like the Brazilian press had quite a bit of influence oh, in, they, like they were, in the country at that time. They were social media. They were Netflix, everything. They were Instagram. They were everything. Yeah. Uh, but they uh, – so he, clearly the guy was making it up. But I've gotten into arguments with historians over this. Because, no, it was it was my I'm like, why? Oh, because it says right here in the caption. Like, That's what Mario Aleixo told the press. Right. It doesn't mean that actually was my This my is before anyone understood what fact-checking was or any of those yeah, things. If someone yeah. cares enough to write it on yeah. a piece of if paper. It, if then, it's in the press, it's got to be true. Like, like this is Rob, I'm paper. sorry. These are very I'm sorry, outstanding but, members of the community. So, oh, God, I'm let's sorry, but this paper now. clearly says that my grandfather, like yeah. – uh, Bob Bradley, he's the one that actually started jiu-jitsu. So, like, I don't know what you're talking about, oh, these crazy guys. 
exactly that. Like, it's that they they wish it were and they want it to be because sometimes they and I found myself being a victim of this too. It's easy to fall victim of that because you find the picture you want it to be true because that makes it his, historically significant finding. And I've made this mistake too. I found an article that you know claims it might have promoted five Brazilians, five Brazilians who most people have never heard of. Now, what we don't know in that article is whether he promoted him today to what we would consider to be a brown belt or what we would consider to be a black belt. That's what's not clear to us is what he promoted them to. Now, in my head, because I found it, I want to go, oh, I want it to be a black belt. Because that's far more significant than Maeda promoting five guys to brown belt, right? That's not that significant. But a black belt would change things. So I find myself leaning towards that. And then I'm like, but I can't say that because I don't know for sure. So it's very easy for the historian to interpret things based off of things that would favor him, you know, because it would make my finding more significant than it would be in case it were a brown belt, not a black belt, for example. So everyone falls victim to this, but it's 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 hard to to not, you know, make you have to make an effort not to, which is a very hard thing to do. Yeah, you know, when I think about the contributions that Maeda had and the kind of the person that Maeda was listening to. You know, you're reading up on your book and listening to your scriptures of him. I think of him as kind of a person that you know was on a diplomatic mission from from Japan, maybe a part of that diplomatic corps, came to Brazil to try to spread the world of of the the Japanese culture, and that was part of what they were doing with the world with Kano and and the um and the in the inception of the creation of judo, right? So he comes to Brazil and he finds out that like after a while, you know, he's one of those guys, and you know, a lot of these guys in BJJ, a lot of these guys are fighting that have been fighting for so long that like they're just over it. You know, they're doing it because it's how they have to make a living. And there's a part of him that still loves the art. But you know, he came to Brazil, he got in touch with uh with Carlos's dad and realized, okay, I can make a few bucks in the carnival doing fixed fights. And then his dad was said, Hey, can you, can you teach my kids how to do jujitsu? And then of course, throughout the course of that, because he had already made his name through the carnival. Cause obviously if you run a carnival, you know how to, you, you know how to put your name out there. That's part of the game, you know, the PT Barnum template. So as he started to gain this recognition, now other Brazilians who were trying to make a living as coaches would say, Hey, look, I'm with Carlos Maeda because he's the guy who showed me everything. He's got the name. He's got the cloud in reality. They're just trying to build a lineage to things that just aren't really there. It's kind of funny because when you think about the ideas of fake black belts yeah. in today's society, it's almost and, like it's almost where it comes from. Same, same thing. <laughs> and, and these guys, you know, and they, they, you know, if we, we, I don't like when people bullshit in general. Like I think that tr people should be trying to be as truthful as possible in general, but we all do. Right. In those days, it was worse. I think in those days, like I'm almost like leaning towards like every martial artist in those days was was a bullshitter. It's just that it was just so entrenched in the culture to lie and deceive that they couldn't even help themselves. It's just it. it I tend to not believe most of what they said because they understood that to make a living, they had to give the public what the public wanted to hear, and that's not always the truth. If you give them a real fight, they don't want it. Give them a fixed fight, they'll applaud you and pay you more. And that went for everything, right? So, you know, today it's easier to fact check people. And if you're willing to do the work, you can catch them on the bullshit. But back in the day, it would have been nearly impossible. Like, how, how, who's going to ch challenge Mario Aisha when he says that he learned from Mitsu Maeda? It was five years later. There's, there's no way you can verify that information, right? I'm, when, when you think about just what people have historically been willing to lie about, and you, you compare it to, you know, the relative unimportance or like lack of being in the, the, the world stage that martial arts have. I mean, people for hundreds of years have gone up to cathedrals and gone to Rome with like a, a finger bone and said, this is St. Paul's finger bone. Like, give me millions of dollars for it. You know, that people have been trying to graph and, and scam and and showcase something as, as if it were something else. With martial arts, I feel like there's a little bit of there's there's mechanisms in place that make that harder because if you say something relating to your ability to fight, people are going to try and fight you. And if you're able to win, you will be able to continue the lie or, or make the lie grow. So all you had to really do was know enough. And back then when no one really knew anything, it was easy. I could go back in time and be like the, 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 the 
red and, and coral belt master of the universe with my crappy anaconda choke, you know, like you, you it's one of those days. And yeah. So, so did you, do you think it was a problem of people learning enough and then realizing they could just go and do their own thing? I think we have a tendency to believe things we want to believe. Just look at, you know, just sticking to contemporary, you know, world. You know, people get stuck in their echo chambers. They read their news, and this is what I want to hear. Therefore, it must be the truth. This other channel here says something I don't like. So therefore, it must be a lie. And the truth is whatever you want it to be. And whether we realize it or not, we're all victim of this. Like I fall victim to it. You fall victim. To it. Look, just look at the books you read. You always read the people you like. You never read the people you don't like. You ever notice that? It doesn't mean they don't have it. Hey, hey, Rob, I I think you're pretty awful, and I read your book. So, huh? How about that? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> it, and, and it said something. We we're, we we lean we where whatever we are emotionally, that's where the facts happen to be, right? And it's it's probably difficult to fall victim, but we all do. Um, this is just going back to me. I just want to finish one point, like why I don't think he's that relevant, even though he is interesting in terms of what he did for ju the spread of judo, for that matter, not just jujitsu or what we call Brazilian jujitsu now. He is practically retired when he's in Brazil. Like he go, he has like he does some demonstrations. He's traveling through Brazil for the first year or two. He's there, and after that, he settles in Belém do Pará. He does teach class, but it's very clear on how much more present he becomes in terms of Japanese immigration. You can see him as he gets older, right? Because he's been fighting his whole life. You got to remember, he left Japan in 1904. So by 1920, he's exhausted, man. Like, this has been a long, I mean, that's just traveling. So he wants to settle down. He has a family now. He gets married. And he's probably leaning towards more profitable things, which makes sense. You know, like, I live the fighter life, and I've taught my whole life. Maybe I don't want to keep teaching. And it's very clear, based off the sources we have, that he hands off the torch to these five Brazilians that he promoted, mainly Jacinto Ferro, which seemed to be his right-hand guy. Now... All the evidence we have points to Jacinto Ferro being Carlos Grace's real instructor. So what Maeda's really did for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, because it does start with Carlos in a lot of ways. Carlos is the, I mean, if you had to go back, like where did this whole thing start? It started with Carlos. Maeda did, what, what Maeda did was he created the environment where Jacinto Ferro would learn, and later Carlos Gracie would learn some Jiu-Jitsu. I actually don't think he learned that much. Right, he goes. He has a seven-year hiatus in jiu-jitsu between two, uh, 1921 and 28. There are no records of him training anywhere, or fighting anywhere, or teaching anywhere. And then he makes a comeback. And then, you know, his comeback is fighting Gio Amore, who, in my opinion, is a better candidate. If you really want to create a link between Brazilians and the Kodokan, Gio Amore is a better link. So, if you really want to be serious about it, you're better off with a Gio Amore picture on your wall than a my Maeda. Because he certainly did more for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. We actually, we, it's pretty obvious he had a friendship with Carlos, that he they had a, you know, I mean, we, we can't confirm this, but given Gio Mori's experience and Carlos' experience, like you can't even, obviously, he was teaching Carlos. There's no way that this was an equal kind of partnership, that one was, it was a student teacher relationship. Very, I mean, I can't confirm it, but it's pretty obvious based off of what we know. Uh, Gio Mori is a better candidate to be Carlos' instructor, in my opinion. It's just that we would have the reason why no one ever put Gio Mori in the spotlight is because he became an enemy of the Gracie family later on. And Maeda never did because Carlos left the to Pana Young and he claimed Maeda's an instructor, which is something that never, no one ever bothered confirming at the time. And now Maeda is at the center of the story. My, my question remains why is Maeda at the center of the story? What did he actually do? He did not spread Jiu Jitsu in Brazil, he had few students, he taught little, he fought little. And then we have men like Gio Mori, who fought for decades. He's one of the first people to fight Balotudo slash MMA in the world. He did not infuse challenges. He would fight anyone, any weight class, gi, no gi, any rule set. The man would fight. And he taught Carlos Gracie. So why are we putting Mike Maeda on a pedestal? The real reason is because he became an enemy of the Gracie family. And once you become an enemy of the Gracie family in those days, you're done. You're done. You're done. And dies, it's a sad story. He dies as a security guard in an aquarium, he has some kind of mental disease that they couldn't explain at the time. And he had a meltdown and he just died really young. But he was a security guard in an aquarium in a small city in the middle, middle of nowhere in Brazil. Died poor. And this guy, if we were to create a link, like this guy's a better candidate. I, it is very speculative. And I'm not going to get uh, any more speculative than, than this. But, you know, with... He he was doing Valley Tudo MMA style tournaments. 
Oh yes, he was doing D no D volatility. You name it. Like this guy. Think, like, and if it was a mental disease, he had a, some sort of mental break. You think it might have been CTE? Like, is that possible? I don't know. I don't know because the press, even the doctors at the time, we're talking. I think he died in nineteen forty-one. I want to say. Yeah, remember. they wouldn't even know what the hell yeah. that was. We're that was still like, figuring it out today. You they, know, go, so. they go mental disease, and, and he he had one daughter, and that was it. He didn't have any great, you know. He never really learned Portuguese. Incidentally, he's just one of those Japanese that never quite learned the language. And wow. the, but he he struggled, and he struggled because of it. But uh, you know, and, and then we have others like Justin Trudeau, who's a better candidate. You know, so why is he through my head of the godfather of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? He's not. You know, it's it's also important to remember that, you know, and this is one of the biggest, you know, one of the biggest themes of your entire book, that there was way more than just two Japanese people that did Jiu-Jitsu oh, no. in I, Brazil at that time. I, I, it was a natural pastime, and there was a tons of tons of Brazilians in the country. Yeah, I was unfair with it. I mean, there's no way I can insert everyone. And I mentioned some names. I try to, you know, name drop as many people as I could so people, if they're really interested, you can pursue that. But I mean, there were thousands of Japanese teaching. We even found one with the grandson of the last samurai. Did you guys see that? Yeah, I saw that. That was pretty interesting. I mean, that was completely unexpected. And I'll just give an example. There were thousands of Japanese teaching jujitsu in Brazil. It's just that, you know, none of them would have an indirect link to a man called Carlos Gracie. And this is why Carlos Gracie is the beginning of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. There's just no way around it. It's his ambition that created Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It's not his skill as a teacher, his skill as a coach or as a fighter. He was not a good fighter from all accounts, but his ambition to create something out of judo. And that is, and there's just no way around it. Like everything does go back to Carlos Gracie, but for completely different reasons than they told us. They tried to sell us one thing and it was like, no, this is not how it happened. It did happen back to Carlos. It is Carlos Gracie, but he didn't do it alone. He's not the most, I don't think he's the most important one in my opinion. I think his son Carlson Gracie is more important, you know, if you ask me, but, um, you know, he he's definitely the beginning. If you happen to find a beginning for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, it's him. I, I think for a lot, of, just uh, before we, we move on, I would love to know. We've talked a lot about how the Carl uh, Carlos's role is is still the beginning of Jiu Jitsu. You know, regardless of who taught him, he was the the inceptor. Yeah. Has your opinion or placement of Elio in the lineage changed at all as a result of the, the research that you'd be willing to talk about and yeah. not spoil anything for the book? I, I think he, Carlos, you know, he, he kicks, he gets the ball rolling. Carlos was an outstanding manager. Like, I don't think he was a good coach first. I don't think he knew that much. Jiu-Jitsu, if you want to be frank. He definitely wasn't a good fighter. I think that what he did was he's like, he got his brothers to fight. I'm like, I'm going to, you're going to fight. We're going to train and we're going to win. And he was an outstanding manager. He was like Dana White of, like, he was that kind of guy. Like, I'm going to make it happen. We're going to do it. Like, he was a very ambitious guy. What he did uh, was he trained his brother, George, you know, who initially was the first hero of the Gracie's family. He was a very, very underplayed character in this whole story as well. For the same reasons Joe Mori got forgotten. If you have a fallout with Carlos and you, well, then you're eliminated from the story. And they were limited from the story. Because they controlled the narrative. They, they, they were the ones controlling everything. They were very shrewd and, you know, getting the press on their side. They had their enemies, too. But, like, they were very – They were, they, put it like this. If they were today, they would have 5 million Twitter followers. Right. Like, they knew how to play the game. They played it well. But he was the one who really continues Carlos' story because it becomes very clear as Carlos gets older. And Carlos was almost like a father to heal. Their relationship is described as a father-son relationship given the age discrepancy. Um, and um, But, uh, you know, Kiwi was the one who really continued what Carlos started. So when people want to say that Kiwi was the godfather of his jiu I think that's unfair. I wouldn't put it that way. But he definitely did more for Jiu-Jitsu than Carlos. He definitely did more. Let me, let me ask you one more question about the Maeda, uh, Kano, um, Judo, Jiu-Jitsu kind of uh, discussion. Because throughout the course, and we'll get back to the, to the Gracies. I got a bunch of stuff about the Gracies too. When, when when you talk about the relevance of judo in Japan, you know, you could talk about Kano taking jujitsu, which was this kind of like fractured art, and turning it into something during the the Cultural Revolution of Japan to, to, to become more Westernized. It was more palatable. That was less dangerous. More more of a sport type activity that still incorporated the ideas of cultural martial arts in Japan and tried to spread them out. And then, you know, obviously Medi or uh, Medea trained at the, at the Kodakon, uh, Geo Tomi trained at the Kodakon, all these guys that are the names 
of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu trained at the Kodakon, but Jiu Jitsu in Brazil is no longer called Judo, it's called Jiu Jitsu. Um, I heard a couple references about falling out with Kano because according to the Kodakon and Kano's rules, you're not allowed to be a professional fighter because it's un ethical in, in his eyes it doesn't follow the code the the bushido code <laughs> tell us about some of the things because in that same chain of thought there's like you said there's tons of judo academies in brazil at the time and you know, the graces and a few others it holds out stuck strong to the jiu-jitsu name right it's broke away from the Kodakon. tell us about how that particular thing started how we 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 see the idea of jujitsu as something separate from judo in those early days and why it came to that um it's well the, the terms you know, the term jujitsu is a generic term the term we we, we, should, we call it jujitsu but it really what we do is not jujitsu what we do is the brazilian version of judo which is just yeah. new that's all it is just brazilians got really good at it and they help spread it around the world and that's a whole separate story. You said a few things that I thought was interesting. The idea of one of the rationales you thought that the reason why Nawaza became more important than Taco was just because of space. Because in Brazil, the gyms are, you know, you had this much room. So tossing people around just isn't right. So we just did it on the ground because that's what we could do. I, I think that's an, it's, it's speculation, but it's, right. I think it's, it's an informed one because it's rare in Brazil that you find you get them after, you know, big enough for standing. Most of them are too tight. Uh, but you know the term is generic. So jiu-jitsu is a generic term. Judo is a form of jiu-jitsu, the pre-Meiji sense of the word, right? Jiu-jitsu, not jiu-jitsu like we call it, right? We westernize the kanji. Uh, and it was, you know, in the West when it first started blowing up, the terms were used interchangeably, and judo was the less common terminology. It was jiu-jitsu was more common. So when the first wave of Japanese come to the West, they're using the term jiu-jitsu. So the name really catches on in the West. The first way these guys used to make money is the circus, is professional fights, fake fights. So jujitsu quickly becomes associated with fake fighting and professional fighting. Jigo O'Connor does not like this. He changes the name to dissociate his school, which had a completely different philosophy from that, right? And he wants to make a distinction. Now, the next wave of Japanese that should start traveling the world out of the Kodokan, they start using the term jujitsu. Judo, I'm sorry, because well, later the term judo becomes more popular amongst Japanese immigrants because it was somewhat of a modern term. The first wave of Japanese used jiu-jitsu. Saddam Yaku used jiu-jitsu. Mitsu Maeda used jiu-jitsu. He did use judo on occasion, but normally he used jiu-jitsu. So it was more just a timing type thing. The name judo hadn't really become synonymous with what their practice has become yet until later on. Let's say this story had started in 1940. No one would be using the term jiu-jitsu. It, it just because it started when Maeda leaves 1904, the common term, not just Maeda, but other Japanese, that first wave of immigrants, the common term in Japan was Jiu Jitsu. So they just go on with it, right? And in Brazil, it really caught on because they, the focus really had an important role in all of this. Like professional fighting, fake fighting was at a huge relevance to this whole story. And the term of Jiu Jitsu kept associated with the circus and these professional fights. As traditional judokas moved away from the circus, they stuck more and more to the term jujudo. And the Brazilians who stuck to the professional fighting scene just kept on with the term jujitsu. And that's where we come from, right? Because our background is not, it stopped being Kodokan after a while and it becomes a circus, it becomes professional fighting. That's how these guys were making a living. That's how George Gracie, Gio Amori made a living. That's how, uh, uh, you know, Helio, his fights were all professional fights. They were not, you know, judo tournaments. He made his name in a professional fight scene. Yeah, it's, so it's it's important to kind of take that, take a moment and think about that too and, and, and the fact of part of the reasons why I feel like jiu-jitsu has evolved into the dominant martial art that what it is because when you think about judo and jiu-jitsu and, you know, we can debate this to all end, like the idea of jiu-jitsu is still based upon a martial art. We're still fighting with each other and i think part of the reason why that happened is because in japan things were moving towards more of a ceremonial purpose because when the samurais used their jujitsu it was to the death there was these ideas if we had confrontations to fight to see was it better but you killed the guy when you lost there was no hey you're good job great work you died so the idea of fighting professionally became distasteful to the bushido code because they were very honorable culture in japan so what you see is the more 
fixed fights, professional fights, things that started to take on professional wrestling that I, I believe would be some kind of an offshoot of what jujitsu was or the samurais. But then when you take a culture like Brazil, you know, you talked a lot about how Brazilian culture, they're fighters. That's what they do. Like when you, when they interviewed Hobson Gracie or, or Robin, Rob, Robson, Robson Gracie, right? Hobson, I said, I said, Robson. Hobson, <laughs> Hobson, right? when they, when, which was one of my favorite interviews of the whole book. It was just interesting to see favorite. Like he, if you want to talk about like the quintessential Gracie, it's Hobson. He's polished. He's got it down. He knows what he's doing. I, I will say fire. though, I it's hard to pick a favorite, but I do love that when you were interviewing Chris Howder, I the way you wrote his word, it's like the way he talks, yeah, and so it was it very. Like Chris, yeah. It was so, <laughs> so the 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 point I'm trying to make is is that. Um, you know, when you, when you interviewed Hobson, he was talking to Hobson. He was talking about how it was like an honor when you were on the street. Men come up to challenge you, and you—that's what you did. You told the girlfriends to stand aside, and that was part of the culture of what was in Brazil. So yeah. now you have this martial art that comes to the states that is tried and tested. You got guys like Helio yeah. that are like, "Hey, we're going to show you who the best is because I'm going to kick your ass. We're going to go fight." Part of that cultural divide is the reason why judo has become an Olympic sport, which, you know, you can you can say it's merits for self, but stuff is useless. But jujitsu is real. There's a real fighting element to it. And and this is the true contribution of the Gracie family. Because I know some people are like, oh, clearly you're attacking the cause of the Gracie family. No, I, just real quick before I don't interrupt you again, but I, reading the book, I'm going to get into it. No, at no point did I ever believe in any way, shape, or form that you were taking away from the contributions the Gracie family had. You were just telling the correct story upon and, that. And, and, you know, men like Carlos and Helio and Carlson and Holt, and they're super important, but just for very different reasons. But what they did do, and this, you got to give them a lot of credit for this because it's a truly incredible story. In fact, I think it's more incredible than what they made it sound. I, I walk away from this with an admiration, not for their methods, but for their ambition. And I admire ambition. That's why the opening quote of like the, the, the film is that, is that Edmund the Bastard speech. It's a speech about ambition. We were born in a lower place, but we will rise above. We're not based. We will grow. We're gonna. We're gonna conquer. It doesn't matter where we were born, who we are. We're not Japanese. It doesn't matter. We're gonna carve a story out of this, and they did carve a story out of it. And they were doing it at a time when no one cared. No one cared to learn. It was niche. It was them, their cousins, some friends, people in Rio de Janeiro didn't know what jiu-jitsu was. Pedro Pano told me this in the '90s when he was a kid. He had never heard of jiu-jitsu, and he was from Rio de Janeiro. Just to give an idea of how niche this was. But yeah, that's and yeah. that's something as Americans, like we have this preconceived notion that like in Brazil, like every kid in every street corner it's, it's, when you're born, they're, they're throw thrown a in a key you, like, the before you can sport. even yeah, you, 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 you learn, walk, you're, you're, you're thrown to the they're, wolves. They're, they're, they're telling trained. you how to do an omoplata, you know. <laughs> I heard of jiu-jitsu for the very first time in my life after Hoist Gracie. And it's the same for Pedro Pan, who's from Rio. I'm from Sao Paulo. He's from Rio, and he had never heard of it. Right. So just to give an idea of like what, and they did keep a martial aspect of judo alive because as becomes Olympic, they're worried about public perception. They need government support. They need the Ministry of Education to support them. They need the Olympic Committee to support them. The private sector's got to sponsor these athletes. They're worried about their public perception. So if we sponsor an athlete who fights now, that becomes a problem, right? So judo has this for, for better for, for, for better or for worse, but they, they have this concern with public perception. Whereas these guys in Brazil, they don't have that concern because they're not an Olympic sport. Like we're gonna keep the martial side alive. In fact, the martial aspect of it, the combat aspect of it, was the only means available to them to keep this this alive. And they did. And they brought it back in '93. And that's incredible because it was this, I mean, we're talking a four decade span of nothing happening in Brazil. Like nothing was happening. Like they had their big moment in 51 against Kimura, which the president was watching. It was a big moment for Jiu-Jitsu. Up to the first Gracie, that was their biggest moment. And then four decades of silence. Yeah, they have some Tudo fights here and there. They had, you know, every now and then they'd be on the press, but it wasn't anything major. It was very niche. And But they stuck to it when most people would have given up. Most people would have been absorbed by Judo. They stuck to their vision. And that's truly remarkable. And it, it's almost like they created a little culture within the old family this own little spark and culture that's not Brazilian. It's not Brazilian. That's that. That's the Gracie fam. That's not Brazilian in any way. We have this little Spartan culture and we're going to eat this way. We're going to train jujitsu. Everyone's going to train. Everyone's going to fight. And if we're going to have to scrap in the streets, it's going to be, you know, one versus one. And they had this code of honor in their way of fighting. If there was more one of them, we would call our brothers. 
like Hobbs and them and a call our brother. They would call and like we'd come over and we'd fight and no one would interfere. Wonderful, beautiful thing. Like, so you know, nostalgic he is about it, right? Yeah. It's, it's do you think really that cool. it, there for a while it seemed that and and this isn't really something you get into a whole lot, but there was a brief time when when Capoeira and BJJ were sort of like in in a rivalry to see what the like what their national method of self defense, their cultural method of self defense would be. Do you think that Capoeira's lacking of a family of a, a standard bearer like the Gracies is why Jiu Jitsu sort of yeah? I think it, it's the, the, I mean without the Gracie family we'd all be doing jiu -Jitsu. and when I say Gracie family I mean specific members I think some members of the Gracie family did more harm than good I'm not going to mention names but some of them did way more harm to jiu than good in my opinion but some I mean, of them, after after we're like after we're not live you know and like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, we would all be doing jiu there's no doubt about that I think that catch wrestling did everything we do before we did they were ahead of judo if you ask me in terms technical terms like it's like they were these guys were doing heel hooks I mean, they were good fighters, but they never had a federation. They never had a Kodokan. That's why they didn't blow up. They didn't have a Gracie family. That's why they didn't blow up. Like, judo had its Kodokan. That's how they grew. They had this, this, this nucleus, right? They kept the whole thing cohesive, and they grew like a beehive, very Japanese style. And, and in Brazil, they had the, you know, it was more chaotic, less organized, but, you know, to the test. Like, you're going to have to prove it. You know how to fight? All right, let's fight. When, you know, when Pedro Metelio got mad at Helio for saying that João Alberto Barreto was the third best fighter in Brazil, Helio first, Carlson second, João Alberto Barreto, Pedro Metelio. Pedro Metelio was furious. Like, how? I'm your oldest student. I'm, like, I was here first. How can you name him number three? Oh, really? Fight. You too. Let's find out who number three is. Pedro Metelio didn't want that. So there's this element in jiu-jitsu that Brazilians kept alive. They go, oh, really? You're that good? Okay, put it to the test. Let's find out. I don't and care. That's all. What I think. Yeah, I don't care what stripes you got on your belt. You're, the, oh, you're yeah. number three? Okay, put it to the test. Let's find out. And that was preserved. And that's what kept this whole thing real. That's why the UFC is as real as it gets. Because right. they kept that... And it, I mean, Volley 2 was not a product of the Gracie family, per se, but they were important in keeping this tradition alive. Right? Because that's how they paid their bills for a long time. It was just like, you know, Carlston Gracie used to joke that if it weren't for me, the Gracie family would be selling bananas in some, at some square in Brazil. Which is probably true. Like he kept the, I mean, that, that, that the decades of silence. He was the guy who was keeping their name relevant. Well, I mean, the Gracies were were pretty well off before jujitsu. Weren't? Wasn't the their father a trader of some kind? I know he came from Scotland, right? Yeah, they 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 had their moments in the 19th century. Like they they seemed to come from money, but if things go astray for them, they're actually struggling. And and Jose Tufikai was in his PhD. Uh, dissertation talks so that's what his PhD dissertation is about by the way if you haven't read it you guys should it's great but it talks about like there's this the term that he uses is Gracie patrician ethos and I just love the word because I think that is that is the key ingredient that speaks back to that ambition I was telling you guys about so we're gonna make it happen no matter what we are scions from the 19th century we belong in a higher place we're not just like everyone else we are better we are different even though they were broke but they still had that ethic of we are, or that 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 the patrician ethos of being you know superior to other people. And Joseph Tufikaius talks a lot about this, and it's a very valid point because I think it was a key ingredient to you know having the Jiu Jitsu be possible is where it was that ambition, that belonging, the sense of belonging that they had of being in a higher place in society. Um, and it's very, very present throughout the story. But for most of their story, they were dependent. I mean, Oscar Santa Maria is someone no one's ever heard of. He was not a fighter. He was not. I learned recently, I actually did teach some classes, but he was not that. That's not why he's important. He was important because he was the, the Jiu Jitsu's bank. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu had a bank. It was called Oscar Santa Maria. And for a long time, he was the one, like, you know, that made, you know, living possible so this thing could continue and survive and have some breathing room long enough to blow up in 93 but he was very important in the sense of like he became like a financier for the Gracie family he was wasn't he also uh somewhat of the spiritual advisor to to uh to carlos senior wasn't he part of the one that kind of brought in some of the occult aspects that the Gracies are kind of famous for no it was well that's what halo says in halo's biography you know Oscar Santa Maria gets Carlos into the, the mysterious, the, 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 you know, spiritualism and the mystique of the Rosicrucian world. 
I, I mean, I think most people would agree it's the other way around. Like, you know, he might have been interested, but Carlos was the leader. It's very clear that Carlos, and I don't say this, I hope no one takes this as an insult to Carlos, but I mean, if you read Halo's biography and you're able to read in between the lines, I mean, she says it out in the open. Carlos was manipulating this guy. There's no doubt that Carlos took advantage of how naive this guy was and how wealthy he was at the same time. So there's no doubt. I mean, it's just, I mean, you read her biography, you read it between the lines, it's what you see. Yeah. Rob, I need you to tell us both and for all of our listeners right now, are we, by doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, engaging in demon worship? Just yes or no, <laughs> all right? Because I, I don't know if I'll stop if the answer is yes, okay? <laughs> I don't know about uh, demon worship. <laughs> Carlos, he, he had like a very, I think he, he knew how to, you know, how to tap into people's he was that kind of guy, like obviously I never met him, but he, he strikes me as the kind of man who would look you in the eye and tell you what you want to hear and convince you just about anything. And Oscar Santa Maria was in his pocket for decades, man. This went on forever. I guess it's towards the end of his life, that's when he snaps out of it, right? His sister helps him, like, hey, listen, this guy's been conning you for years, right? That's, the long story short, that's what um, what was happening. But I mean, and this is not me, like every historian, if this is one of the few the things that everyone agrees on, historians don't agree on anything, but this one everyone agrees on, it's pretty obvious that Carlos is, you know, manipulating uh, Oscar to his own benefit. Yeah, I, I think a lot when I think about the impact that the Gracie family had on the influence of jiu-jitsu and the spread of jiu-jitsu is, is, you know, they were these, they were the family that were just, we're not going to judo, this is what we do. We're going to be the rebels. We're going to stand out. We're going to continue to post these events. We're going to continue to do everything we can do to have fights. We'll have Gracie challenges. We'll have any kind of gym stormings we can do to continue to promote the name of the Gracie family because we've carved our little niche out into the public. And one of the biggest quotes that you kept bringing back up in the book is when, again, another one from Hobson, when you asked him about the influence of Maeda, and he said, well, you know, yes, if it, you, people always talk about Maeda, 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 but without Halia, without Carlos, no one would know who Maeda was. So, yes, was there some instances where maybe the Car maybe Carlos and Halia maybe learned a little on their own? Maybe it took a little bit from here, a little bit from there, and kind of developed their own system based upon that, and then spouted the lineage. Sure, but like without any of that, like you said, we'd all be doing judo. There'd be nothing left. A hundred percent. 100%. And, you know, my, my it's ironic, but I, my Ida, even though everyone, every Brazilian who wanted to be popular in jiu-jitsu is borrowing his name, right? They're using his name to promote themselves. But it was because of that that he's remembered. If it were not for, you know, Carlos Grace, especially, if it were not for Carlos, no one would know who my Ida was. I, I, I mean, in the Kodokan, there's a picture of my Ida on the wall. It's at the Kodokan Museum, meaning they acknowledge that piece of their history. Was that unique in their history? No, there were thousands of Japanese from the Kodokan who traveled the world. Why Maeda? Why is Maeda remembered? Maeda is remembered because of Carlos Gracie. Yeah. And that's the point I make. It was it's Carlos that makes Maeda, not the other way around. Maeda would have been a footnote in history had it not been for Carlos Gracie and his marketing efforts. Yeah, that's that's it. That's impressive, man. I I, I think about that a lot. And again, because we can talk with everyone about how you know, the Gracie family created their aspects of what they believe, like they created Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and all those other things. And there's even, when you talk to Hobson again, he actually says, well, you know, Halio created the the first rule set for the Jiu-Jitsu Federation. So was, if you really want to. That was Pedro Valente who said, which is a good point. Right, right, exactly. You know, so like in reality, if we want to talk about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, it's at false. There's a lot of ways that you can interpret things to say, well, you know, like, is he, is he using hyperbole? Maybe, but he's also right. <laughs> you know, without Carlos, we'd probably, there wouldn't really be a jujitsu anymore. You've got guys like, um, who was the Amazon? Who was the one in, in this, in the suburbs? I forget his name. Fab. Father. Fada, right? You've got Fada that kind of broke away and did his own thing. You've got guys like Medi that came back and did his own thing separate from, uh, from the Brazilians, but those guys weren't ambitious. So the real point of the story is, is that yes, there are people in the world that, that manipulate things to, to their own ambitions, to their own right, to be able to make things good for themselves. But like 
we need those people. You know, <laughs> like the world needs people like that. I, I, it's a bit of a conflict. You need me on that wall. You need me on that wall. <laughs> and we, there's a, and I, at the end of the book, I talk about this because the conclusion to me is, does the end justify the means, right? right. The means yeah. are pretty. The means were not pretty, in my opinion. But it's because of those means that I have a job today and I found my life's purpose. I would have been a very unhappy person had I not found jujitsu. And I have many of these characters to thank for that so we can't forget that even though we can still condemn the actions right I and mean, it sounds contradictory but i don't really think it is you know, it didn't really sound so. i i think that that's interesting then because so are you by saying that in that segment are you like there's a lot of things that were bad about the way that brazilian jiu-jitsu grew south and then made its way north yeah. But the art itself was never the problem. The effectiveness of the techniques were never the problem. And and I, I think I, knowing that, and maybe the you know the the windshield is bigger than the rearview mirror, obviously. But looking back, I I kind of find that some of these like exaggerations and mythologies that grew up around jujitsu might not have been necessary. You know, I feel like there's enough good here that this could have grown on its own if they just they needed zealot advocates like the gracies they needed a a unit that would die for this to work you know and and give everything do you think that all of the the deceptions and sort of half truths they needed to happen for us to be here now with jujitsu in a safe place in the world where it is it's impossible to say for sure but I, I think that the answer is yes. It's interesting because imagine if we knew everything we knew now in 93. Jiu-Jitsu wouldn't exist. We, they, I mean, they, it's, it's like they, we, Jiu-Jitsu needed enough time to establish. No one, you guys are not going to quit Jiu-Jitsu because of what I just said. No. Right? No one's going to quit Jiu-Jitsu. In fact, it makes me love the art even more. But in 93, if people knew this, they might have been like, ah, you guys sound like you're full of it. Right, and that would have been a huge a hit to the sport. So the fact that the Brazilian National Library, which is kind of what got this whole thing kick started, really is technology. In 2012, if I recall, um, they digitized. I mean, yes, they got digitized. If that had been done in 90, 90, 91, suppose the technology was there, that, the story would have been very different. I'm convinced. I think this came out at the right time, at a time where jujitsu was so established, right, in the world that. Whatever we know just augments, you know, our passion for jujitsu. At least speaking for myself, I don't love jujitsu less. Coming out of this, um, this uh, research, I think I, I like, I love it even more. I love it in different ways. I think the story is even better than the one we had heard. Not to, not to get weirdly religious on it, uh, on this topic, but I, I find a lot of parallels between something like this and and sort of people becoming disillusioned with like the Catholic Church and like uh, it's a it's an organization of fallible people yeah. and putting faith in fallible people is never going to go well. You got to, you got to reach beyond that. So a lot of people uh, keep their faith by saying, my faith is in the eternal. You know, like my faith is in the thing up there and people down here, I'll taking, take what I can get. You know, you gotta, you gotta put your faith in the ideal that won't let you down rather than people that will. And it's, that sounds kind of like what is happening. Like if you put, your faith in the Gracie family instead of jujitsu, you're going to get let down no matter how good the Gracies are. At least and, that's what I'm sort of thinking. And, and I think that's a good point. Like you can be a Catholic and I, I mean, I'm not a Catholic, but if I, I, I wouldn't have an issue if I were like condemning the Pope while still thinking, okay, but there's this little thing here in Matthew called the Sermon of the Mount. And it's a beautiful document and there's nothing wrong with me living my life based off this document. And, you know, the Catholic Church maybe is, I mean, I, I wouldn't say this, but like maybe some Catholic would have those, you know, I can still, um, you know, learn, I can still go to church on a Sunday, take my kids, and maybe it's going to be, there can be better people um, for this, right? I would stick, I, I would I would cease my, you know, not to get too religious, but I would, I would stop at the Sermon of the Mount. It's a beautiful document, and that's that's where it ends for me. So, one of the things that I think you did one of such an amazing job with this book and this documentary, particularly in the book from what I've read and from your insights into the interviews is this, is that by telling the history of the reality of what happened, you also 
make us better understand, like you said, the the ends versus the means. Uh, we learn about what, how these factions of history, how the the the, the characters involved and in the breaking off from Japan and all the other things that happened culturally in the two different sides help to form this amazing art that we have today. And we talked a lot about, you talked a little bit about how you're not sure what, if it would sort of come to the same thing. But one of the things that I really thought that caught me the most about this book was how you paint a picture of what you believe jujitsu was lacking and where you believe its strengths are, particularly where I'm talking about when you went back to Japan and you went to some of the coast and judo uh, studios and some of the old or coast and, and some of the old judo studios and some of the more traditional Japanese aspects of the art. And one of the things I found to be very interesting was that you talked about particularly how jujitsu was missing that aspect of honor that you get from Japan. But Part of that problem is is that the honor and the indoctrination, the the, the ability to look at your uh, your your leader, your your instructor as this infallible, very formal pedigree. You know, when you talk about the dogma, like you're doing what the instructor told you because his instructor told him that, and his instructor told him that. So there's not really any variance. There's not really room for the art to grow. So whereupon we are missing that in the casual laissez faire atmosphere of jiu-jitsu in america and in brazil like we also grew to a second level because of that and i'm going to read a little excerpt from the book i'm going to talk for a few seconds you've been talking the whole time because in my opinion robert like i, I mean this I, I remember i sent you a text i'm not gonna read the whole damn paragraph because it's too much but i sent you a text as soon as i read this paragraph and it was literally like i was so in awe at the beauty of the writing of it because it really just encapsulates everything about what jujitsu is in a nutshell. I hope I don't screw it up too bad, but I'm going to go ahead and try to get through this. All right. So it's at the end of the, the last section on Japan where you're getting back and you're kind of thinking about the two things. And it's this. This constant improvisation and adaptation to new circumstances would create what I refer to as the culture of open software. This is opposed to doing things exactly how your coach taught you and passing along the to future generations a fixed canon of techniques. This phenomenon is perhaps best expressed in the total lack of curriculum in Brazil for BJJ. This freedom for all to adapt, redact, and alter at will and accordingly and according to one's abilities and needs is one of BJJ's most endearing qualities in my view. In fact, this grappling intelligence is so at odds with our standard view of intelligence that ha that has it, that had has made me over the years rethink entirely the meaning of the word. And when I think about jujitsu, and I think about the works of Carlos Gracie to be this rebel, like him or love him, whatever he was a bastard. You know, the, the Gracie families. You can say whatever you want to about the Gracie families. They've got their they got their problems. The culture of Brazil in general in that period. You know, there's some issues with the formalities and some issues with what we believe really is at the core. Because when Kano created judo, he wanted to be this learning experience. He wanted to bring back into what we are. But when we talk about the system of events that led to where we are now, it's very important to recognize that in particular, the idea that we are learning on our own, like you do in like what you talk about Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking didn't become Stephen Hawking because he played by the rules, because he stepped off and went down his own went down his own way. And, and jujitsu is in its own course of uh, I, I don't suggest we be like judo. I, I disapprove of a lot of things, but I, there's some things that too be learned. To me, one thing that stood out, and you know, I had been to Japan, I had been to judo clubs before, but this last trip really stood out. Is I remember when I showed and I talk about this in the book. Uh, I showed up like maybe 30, 40 minutes early to set up the camera equipment, and the course of judo black belt, the black belts, paying black belts, right? We're sweeping the mask before class. I had never seen that in this club. Just to give an example, not to shit on my students, but I'm going to shit on them. <laughs> so if you're listening, <laughs> I am talking to you. All the all the colored belts in Nevada, <laughs> Duncan cover. <laughs> Sometimes, like you know, I'll ask like a purple belt to help with a student, a beginner. Like I'll have a new beginner who needs help learning what a mount is, and I've got class with 20, 30 people, and I'll ask one of my purple belts to help. 
right? And they don't say anything, but they give me that look like, <laughs> you got to pay me. Like, and, and, and it's just, it's like, how do we come to this? How do we go from black belts, paying black belts, showing up 30 minutes early to sweep the mats to a purple belt, not wanting to help out a little bit with the beginner food? And my point is we've become so incredibly arrogant and self-infatuated and it's so individualistic. It's this me, me, me culture. I, I don't know where it's going to end, man. It's pretty, it's pretty disgusting. Like, I think that if your coach, I remember when I was in Sao Paulo back in the day, right? And Leo would be, Leo Vieira was the coach. And he would go to Europe for some seminar or whatever. And I remember like a couple of times he would ask me to teach class for him. I didn't live in Sao Paulo. I had to drive to Sao Paulo. It was a two-hour drive. And I would get there. And, you know, and Leo would be like, hey, Rob, would you run a class for me this week? And I'd be like, me? You're asking me to run class? Like, I felt so honored that he would ask me to replace him. I have all these badass black belts on the mat. And I was so honored. Like, it never crossed my mind to ask him for money. It never crossed. I was driving two hours each way to teach class for someone else. It never crossed my mind to ask for money. And I get my purple, but sometimes they're like, yeah, I don't want to really help that wife out. I'm like kind of important. You know, I, I took second at the Naga tournament the other day. So I got mean, <laughs> like, I got like 10,000 followers on my Instagram. I'm sort of. Oh, man. Now I'm tempted, yeah. to, I'm tempted to write down all this info and be like, who's, who is this? <laughs> and, no, it's, and it's, you know, it's not a person. It's, a, it's, a, it's an attitude. And it's very present in the younger generation. They're very, there's no hierarchy. There's no the hierarchy is gone. Where's the hierarchy? The hierarchy is, um, you know, I don't know. I think, you know, it's, it's popularity. It's money. Is that the best way of creating a social hierarchy is my question. Are there better hierarchies? Should hierarchies be based off of knowledge and wisdom? Or should they be based off of other things? Because we've created a very strange hierarchy. And not just talking about jiu-jitsu, but the world in general. Hierarchy seems to be, you know, a very strange one. Uh, and I, that's what I envy. It's like, it seems to me that judo, they kept a hierarchy straight. They honor the elderly. They There's a respect for the mats and your instructor. And it's not, I mean, if they're paying students, they pay as well. But... You know, it's not just about the money. I pay you client, businessman relationship. There's something else to be said about martial arts as a means of education, which I think that we're losing. And it's something that's very ingrained in judo. And I think Jigoro O'Connor was brilliant for seeing that. And he kept it in judo. Has It's remarkable how cohesive they have remained over the centuries. And I truly believe that it's not the only ingredient, but one of the ingredients why this is possible is because they managed to keep that aspect of Japanese society alive in the martial art throughout the world, that hierarchy and respect, which is something Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu does not have or lacking that. And that's why I, will Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu be around 100 years from now? I don't know. I'm not so certain. I think Judo will be. I think Judo is going to be around for another 100 years. I, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I can't say that. Yeah, I... I think a lot about that when I think about just the modern professional jujitsu grappling scene right now. And you just think about, you know, I get it. There's the idea that you have to promote things. You have to make the hoopla. It's just, it's very distasteful. And I think to myself, what Kano would say, if you were to think about what his art has become and would he really be pleased with where we've come post that, you know, because again, I, the more and more I read this book, the more and more I think I'm a samurai. And I'm not saying that in any way, shape, or form, but facts. Like, what we do keeps the art of the samurai alive. What judo does keeps the art of the samurai alive. So, like, am I out fighting for my death in the streets? Or am I, you know, am I am I challenging people to, to fight for a code? Not necessarily. But the art and the integrity and, and the idea of going on a journey and learning things about yourself throughout the course of, of, of your training in jiu-jitsu means that I am on the samurai way because that's the way I believe it. Yeah. So when I think of the way things have evolved and the way things happen and I think about what Kano's idea of, you know, you don't fight professionally because like when the samurais fought, they did it for honor because it was, I want to be the greatest samurai. Even when they fought each other in their exhibitions, it was to the death. There was no like, all right, I beat the shit out of you just because everybody can watch it. And I got Sorry, paid. Uh, 
Kev, I just feel like I got a good visual aid for where you're going with this conversation right now. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. I went my face. <laughs> I, would, I would be behind you, like, hold the sword. Shout, like, out. <laughs> Shout out to Mr. Mendoza, underside land, <laughs> with the, but with the, the clutch the, illustration that this is going to be what we put on your headstone, Rob. Not going to lie. This is how, this is how we're going to remember you. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, the point the point I'm trying to make is is that like when we think about it, it's not like the Bushido code that was represented by the samurais in the old days. And you can get mad if I want. I know these guys, ah, oh, well, you're just not making money. You're not doing that. Like it saddens me. You can do all of those things and still be respectful. And it just it hurts me a little bit to see it. No, I just just to just to you know to go build off your point, I, I'm in favor of hierarchies. I'm not one of those that you know believes that all oh, you know. Everyone, it's not, it's not some people work harder than others. There are some people who are better than others in jiu-jitsu, and we ought to honor that. It's just that it's the, it's the, the, the way, the hierarchies that we're building are incorrect. We ought to, so I'll give you an example. Some of the, the, the grand masters we spoke to, like they're in their 90s, and they were so happy to tell their story. And I'm like, wait a second. So you're telling me that people aren't coming and interviewing you like every other day? Like in my head, like these guys, these guys are the first Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioners. And I was getting the vibe from them that they hadn't been interviewed in years. Like no one no one cared to listen what they had to say. That's why they were so happy to tell their story. But they're still doing it because they love the art. My bad, yes, I didn't interrupt you. Yeah, right. Absolutely. But like it, it, to me, if, if you know, we shouldn't be – okay, so a 22-year-old might be incredible at jiu-jitsu, but he has nothing to say. At 22, you don't know shit about fuck. Let's be honest. You really don't. You think you do. You think you. You think you know women. You don't. You think you know money. You don't. You think you know life. You don't. But you believe you do. Twenty-two. You're good at jujitsu. My point is, I we should not, uh, we should not like leave out men like Armando Ridded from from the jujitsu hierarchy. They had a lot to say. There's a lot of there's there's a lot to learn from them in a way that it's not just about the skills. Is what I'm trying to say. Even though, and I and I talk and I think at the end of that kind of wrap this up because to me these things can coexist. I mentioned Carlson Gracie as the man who completed O'Connell's vision. In my view, and I don't mean to and you know insult anyone in judo, but they fell short from combat reality, you know, base. They, they become too much of a sport. They interrupt the fight all the time. There's not enough ground, not enough submissions, right? Not even they, they eliminated the single leg and the double leg. These things are mistakes. But they kept the, the in, in cultural terms, I think they did a great job. In technical terms, they're kind of lacking. But I think if, I came to think as Carlson Grace is a man who completed that. Like I think it is possible we have a hierarchy based off of merits and and efforts and skill, but also you know one that is one that founded on on respect while being efficient. You don't have to be we, these things can coexist. Is my is my point. And right now it's we we don't have that. It's all you know up you know out in the air. We don't is the uh, the cohesion that judo has. We don't have. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't say anything else. Like, I, I literally, like Rob, I can't tell you how amazing this book was for me to read on so many different levels because it speaks volumes to to what I believe to be, you know, the purpose of jujitsu. Like, I, you know, I, I did a little competing here and there. I did a few things. I had some fun with it. I made a, once I some, once my BJJF. Uh, well, but I'm not trying to brag <laughs> to Robert Drysdale. You know, what I'm talking I about. Know. I'll brag I'm just for saying you. that I. I had a few, I did a few things and had some fun doing that and like thought for a little while that that was everything. That was all to me. Like I had to be on Kasai or I had to be an EBI and that was all that was important to me. And where I enjoy working with those level of athletes, UFC fighters and helping them get ready for the next level. What I really now in my, my later days, you know what I mean? Well, I'm kind of like backing off enjoy more than anything is the things that you talk about in the book, the idea of taking people on a journey and allowing them to learn and involve through the art of jujitsu. And in my mind, that is what Kano's jujitsu was. And, you know, it changed through Carlos Gracie's influence. It became what we have today. And I'm very pleased that that happened, that transformation happened. But I agree with you that we can have both worlds. We don't have to be this dogmatic do what I say because it's the way it goes, but we can have the ethos of respect and honor that is what really makes this art so great while having the innovations involved that happen from being in the strong holdouts. I, I agree entirely. That's uh, that's always been my vision of jiu-jitsu. We can, 
we can learn from, you know, take from judo and other arts what we like and and, and keep the open open software culture simultaneously. I think the open software okay. culture is a very good, it's a lab, right? The UFC is a laboratory. IBJJF tournaments are a laboratory for weeding out the bullshit and sticking to what works, which is a very good north. My dog, man. I, I just, I want to real quickly say that, you know, every, like, Everyone's got different things that, that keep them in jujitsu. You know, I realized pretty quickly on that I was never going to win gold. You know, that's not my place in the sport. Not it bitter in any way, just like it's just not my my purpose. You know, I, I'm here because I love the people and I love to do it. And I feel like my, my talents as a, a writer fit well into building out the sport as much as I can on the journalism side of things. And I just, you know... You said uh, earlier you don't know if you if jujitsu is going to be around for a hundred years. I'm pretty confident saying that if if guys like you keep doing their thing about objectively viewing the sport we love, trying to bring truth to it, giving more people big questions to ask, the sport will be around for a very very long time. And I want to thank you for all the the efforts you're putting in because it's it's not it doesn't mean nothing. It means a lot, you know, and maybe. Sometimes you don't see that immediately and you need other people to remind you. So thank you for all the hours you're putting in, you know, no, um, it was, it was not an effort, man. It was a pleasure. And uh, again, like, you know, I, I played my part in all of this, but there are a lot of people that go into, um, uh, you know, making this possible people that made me aware of this research. that have been researching longer than I have I mentioned their names in the book. So I hope that they get their due credit as well. Um, it's been fun, man. Like this has been single-handedly some of the best memories of my life is filming this documentary and writing this book has been a lot. I mean, I, I didn't expect it to do that. I mean, my head people don't read, but it's actually doing really well. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's my I literally every time I write, every time I spend like the better part of a day writing, I thought like writing an article, I put it out and I think to myself, like my mom's gonna read it. There'll yeah. be like four other people that read. Nobody reads anymore. I don't know why I'm doing this, but I love it anyway. So you do what you yeah. Do. It's it's you know what I think ultimately when you write, you should be writing for yourself. That's if it. You happen to like it, great. If they don't, that's fine too. Yeah. History, history history isn't really a paying gig. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it was, it was fun writing it, man. Like, I feel like after this, if if some college somewhere doesn't offer you the the graduate degree, just like hey, you did the the effort, you know, come on, just we'll give fine. you the come yeah, be a graduate speaker. Fine. We'll give you the piece of paper, and that's then you can just go this, is your, this, this is your this is your dissertation. Reconnect with the Brazilian University, see if I can continue my master's there. And they know you have to physically be here. It's like, oh, oh, man, you can't win. I can't win either way. I'm not meant for that. It's not going to happen. It's fine. Uh, oh, fuck them. You don't so, need that piece of paper anyway. Carlos obviously, <laughs> obviously, to all of our listeners and, and viewers out there, go get yourself a copy of this book. Link in the description oh, of the yeah, video. Yeah. It is an absolute page turner and like Kevin and I barely read, and the yeah, fact that you we literally like, it, sit me to sit for, for me to sit down and read this Bible, like yeah. it took, if it it's took not a, but the it's, fact it's that I can, the fact that I got through a non fantasy novel should tell you that you should go <laughs> read it because like that's the only thing I read anymore. But obviously, this is a, a prelude to a, a much more ambitious project, which is ultimately going to be the documentary. I know there were some snags here and there, but before we we wrap this up and let you get back to work. Are there any updates or are you able to point us to any uh, any uh, progress being made on the production side of things or is COVID uh, sort of? COVID slowed everything down. <clears throat> mm -hmm. COVID slowed everything down. Um, but it's not just, it's just, you know, there's uh, it's been, it's, it's been a very difficult project. I think, maybe, I think my lack of experience, and I mean, this not so much as in film as in terms of, a leading an operation of this magnitude like it, i was put in a position of really overconfident in my ignorance you know so when you don't know nothing about something you, you tend to be very confident about it the more you know about something the more of a coward you become right? like, and not knowing anything i walk into this going like ah, i got this right and you know and then you make a lot of mistakes and you pay dearly for some of those mistakes and, uh, I've made my fair share of mistakes, and they were not they were out of ignorance and overconfidence in the sense where i I thought that things were gonna move in a way um, that I would be able to i mean I, I, I assume that things were gonna move very smoothly. and it's been uh, it's a lot more work than you would think. And I would have done things slightly different if I had a time machine, but I don't. 
So the good news is the film will happen. The question is when I don't know because a lot of it is not in my control. Um, it is going to happen though. It is 100%. We've been, we're under budget. I, I didn't spend close to what Meyer Beck gave me. Most people would have both the money. Like I'm such, I, I made my guys sleep in like the cheapest hotels in the We had one car with tons of camera equipment. Everyone's so angry at me because they're so uncomfortable. The whole 18 time. people packed into a one room favela. <laughs> hey, shit. We're gonna, not going to blow through this money. It's not our money. This is someone else's money. We're not going to blow through it. So I made it as cheap as we could. We, and we were way under budget. So that's the money is not the problem. Uh, it's just uh, it's it's a very complex story, and to tell it in ninety minutes is virtually impossible. Like we, uh, I, I just the book is is a very good comp, uh, com, uh, uh, an extension of the film because everything that I wanted to get in the film that we're not going to be able to get in the film, I think I was able to get across in the book. So you know, if you're really into this, I think the book's a good companion. But the film is definitely going to happen, guys. I apologize to the fans on, on, on behalf of me and myself and, and the team. But, you know, if, if I, I just some things are completely out of my control. Well, I mean, go, go, go do your diligence, man. Get this damn thing done. I know it's, I know, <laughs> like, I, you, know you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I understand. I'm, and I'm be, I'm saying that from the most optimistic point of view, I can tell you because I realize you're at the, you're at the end there's a breaking point and you're concerned about all the different things. And from someone that has been involved in other artistic endeavors at the end of the day, like don't overthink it. Don't over edit it. Don't ever change it. Get some shit out there, make it your best effort, but get the finished product out because at the end of the day, the information will, will be enough. And if you want to drop like a few interviews just to like wet the palette on YouTube, that yeah, you know, too. if you need like, me, you know, it, I, I'm like, available if you'd like to have you know, my insights, I'd be more than happy to. to so not to, not to hold anyone's feet to the fire, but do you have any kind of timeline or projection for when we're going to be able to go buy this thing, watch it, or, you know, waiting on that a little bit? Well, we're going by sections. I just watched today another sex six minutes segment, which was really good. Some some things that have to be tweaked. The good news is every cut that comes back is better and better than the last, in my opinion. So that's the good news. So it's not one of those things where, oh, it's delayed for no reason. It's delayed because it's getting worse. No, it's delayed because it's getting better. And I think that's that's a good and that's the good news, right? And I I don't hope not to sound you know pessimist. It's just because I. You know, you know. Obviously, I wrote the book in quarantine. Like if I can do something right now, I don't do it tomorrow. I'm going to get it done immediately, and and that's always been my my demeanor towards things. But you know, the, the good news is is my team is incredibly talented. They're very very good at what they do, and the film has turned out to be quite beautiful. I think it's. I I mean, honestly, if they were done entirely my way, Rob was completely in charge of everything, and there were no out uh, uh, external input. I would have been a very boring film. It would have been very informative. It would have been very informative, but it would have been very boring. Because like I, I think as a historian, to me, it's all the information that matters. I, I don't care about anything else but the information. I've always been that that's when I when I read, it's like what are you telling me? That's what I want. Whether right? you know, that's the most important part to me. But I think that the, what's coming across is not only something that's informative, but a very good balance with something that is it's a truly beautiful film. I, I think that I mean, we even, I mean, I don't know enough about film, but like my team, had, they have the ambition of winning the work for this. So I don't know if we're going to make it that far or not, but I mean, I'm not holding my breath, but I wouldn't be surprised because, you know, they, they're, they're very talented and they're very good at what they do. All right. Closed guard coming to Sundance. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, I think that the subject matter alone and what is revealed in the book will put this with any documentary that's that's out during award season no doubt i think that you've got some Jiu -jitsu absolutely. Hot right now, man. Jiu well this this stuff is like it, there's intrigue there there's there's drama there's 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 lies there's fighting people in brazil like it's globalization it's the story of globalization it's the story of japanese immigration it's the story of the rubber boom it's the story of japanese the, the impact of that exotic like the, so Japanese are exotic to the West, right? There's this jujitsu boom in early in the 20th century, and they end up in the Amazon, the Brazilian Amazon, out of all places. And they meet this family of Scottish descent who are obsessed with having a place in society, and jujitsu becomes the vehicle for that placement. 
I mean, it's an incredible story. Like it, it is, the, it is the type of story that only a trained killer who speaks three languages could tell. Exactly. I think that's about the best way you could sell it as possible. <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't know, but like, I, I think I, I, that was, you know, I, I played a small role in all of this, but it's been, it's been truly. I feel that it's not been an effort. This has been kind of the, the greatest moments of my life. Were you know, and getting involved in this production. I'm very, very happy. I was actually surprised when I first started looking into this, I was surprised that no one else had done it. I'm like, what do you mean that no one's looking at What do you mean? You tell me that we know all this about the history of Jiu-Jitsu and no one's trying to make a film about it? That blew my mind that no one was trying. And I'm like, all right, I guess I'm going to do it. I'm going to try to do it quickly too before someone else does it. <laughs> All right. Well, Rob, uh, I know we, we gotta, we gotta get going now, but, uh, thank you so much for, for stopping by to give us uh, all the updates and for, for giving us some insights into this amazing book. Again, can't tell you enough. Go check it out. Everyone listening and watching the show. But, um, I think that's, that's, a, that's about it. Kev, you got any closing remarks or nothing, man. I, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed this book and I can't tell you how much I appreciate <laughs> you for writing it. And I can't, stop talking about it enough i've literally told every person i know about it every jiu-jitsu every every personal training every client i have every every private lesson every student everybody i know i told them to go buy this damn book so if you're listening now you should go buy it too if you listen if you watch jiu-jitsu you have anything to do with and I, just, just so you know i mean i guess i'm plugging myself i hate doing that but i guess <laughs> um if um you know if the link is on in my bio on instagram or the film's bio on instagram you just click on the on the profile there's a link there it goes straight to the shopping cart yeah. we'll have we'll have a link yeah up we'll on throw it down in the bottom sure. here yeah oh, thank you all right well yeah everybody this has been a bit of a longer but necessary by necessity episode of the jiu-jitsu times podcast so much went over today with a guest who's IQ could double as the circumference of the sun. So we appreciate him giving us so much of his time. Uh, yeah, uh, go check out this book. But in the meantime, I have been your host, Kevin Bradley, joined as always by my co-host, Mr. Kevin Gallagher, and fan favorite guest, Mr. Robert Drysdale. Rob, thank you again for stopping by. We hope to have you on closer to the release date of the film. Uh, definitely keep us up to date on that. But but yeah, go go take a nap, man. You earned it. <laughs> okay, I got tons of work to do, man. But All right. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, if any of you guys and or anyone listening is ever in Vegas, please come visit us at the gym. We are a non-political gym. Everyone's welcome. Come check us out. Come do some, you know, train. Right? There's a lot of history, but we got enough. We most important things. They actually train every day. Let's not forget that. Yeah, but if you're if you're a higher belt and Rob asks you to help out with one of the white belts, do it and don't have a look on your face. <laughs> Seriously, you help. Okay, every purple belt out there should be helping their black. You should be honored to help your black belt instructor. Seriously, so many of your purple belts are just like, oh, geez. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I hope he wasn't talking about me. They're all gonna be. They're all gonna be. They're all gonna have their own personal white belt tonight. When you come to <laughs> You're gonna go back, and they're just gonna be like, all right, Timmy. So what you want to do? With this so you sweet, gotta man. grab the grip here. <laughs> Great, John. You're doing great, John. Hey, Rob, John's doing great. You yeah, see? Look, look how good John's doing. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, as and as we're staring down a second lockdown, everybody, uh, remember to stay safe. Uh, uh, be cognizant of washing your hands. Uh, check in on your loved ones and uh, support your local gym because it looks like if we need to close down again, you guys are what keep everything going. So remember to do that. Okay. Uh, episode over. Good night and good luck. <laughs> Thank you, guys.